Thank you, Art, and let me add my welcome to this event. We're very pleased to see so many of you come and still coming in. Uh, Phi Beta Kappa is the nation's oldest scholastic organization at the university level. It was founded in December 1776, so it is 241 years old. And our association is made up of members of Phi Beta Kappa from colleges and universities all across the country. So if you were elected as an undergraduate and became a member of Phi Beta Kappa, you're welcome to join our association. As a matter of fact, if you have not joined our association, we do have forms sitting outside on the table, and you're welcome to fill that out and join us. One other th uh, housekeeping thing to announce is that some of you received note cards when you came in, and we do have others available. Instead of asking for questions after the talk is over, we're going to ask you to fill out your question on a note card, and I will collect those, and we will ask Mayor Abramson those questions. So hopefully we'll have enough time for five or six additional questions after the talk is over. So now let me introduce our speaker, Jerry Abramson, who has held the role of the longest serving mayor of Louisville for 21 years, and he has the nickname Mayor for Life. During his time as mayor, Mr. Abramson was um, president of the United States Conference of Mayors in 1993. He also played a leadership role in the successful uh, consolidation of the city of Louisville with Jefferson County. After serving as mayor for that length of time, he became lieutenant governor for the state of Kentucky serving under Governor Brashear. That was from 2011 to 2014. During that time, he chaired the Governor's Blue Ribbon Commission on Tax Reform. That was 2012. And he also focused his efforts on education and economic development. So perhaps one of the questions we'll get him to answer is what he thinks about the current efforts for tax reform and pension reform. So after serving as Lieutenant Governor, Mr. Abramson served as the Deputy Assistant to the President and Director of Intergovernmental Affairs from November 2014 to January 2017. Obviously, that was for President Barack Obama. And in this role, he oversaw the Obama administration's domestic agenda with state, city, county, and tribal elected officials all across the country. So since 2017, he and currently, Mr. Abramson holds the position of executive in residence at Bellarmine University. He has responsibilities for developing and directing a new institute for local state government leadership that will train elected officials from all across the nation. He will also be teaching undergraduate courses in leadership, public finance, and community development. Please help me welcome Jerry Abramson. Appreciate it. Thank you all. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's what, what's so interesting. Can you, well, let's be sure you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? And does this microphone work too? Can you hear me okay in the back? No? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, what's so interesting about this evening? is I got a letter, I received a letter when I first came back to Louisville and started at Bellman from Janet Dakin, the director, is that your position, executive director of the Phi Beta Kappa uh, chapter here, this, this organization that's hosting. And she said, Jerry, could you, and she used to be a neighbor, she and her late husband, 
And her late husband, by the way, was the geography professor that designed the map for the 26 districts of the Metro Council. Okay, he's the one that did it. It wasn't done politically, it was done by an academician who did an outstanding job. So she sends me a note, she said, would you take the time and, and come uh, to the uh, annual meeting of, of the Phi Beta Kappa, the longest, oldest, most prestigious uh, academic honor society in America? And I said, well, yeah, of course. And she said, well, we'll have about <clears throat> 40 or 50 people, <clears throat> and you can just sort of talk a little bit about what, what things are going on. And I had this fear that I would be coming into a room with all these high intellectual driven arts and science uh, accomplished honor students. And I would be like, for those of you that are uh, like Madeline and I watch um, The Big Bang Theory, I would be Penny <laughs> compared to, to to Dr. Cooper and all of the brainiacs, you know? And then they said, no, we're gonna have about 300 or so people that are gonna visit and it's gonna be open to the public. And as I said to Madeline as we were coming in, I said, you know, it makes me feel a lot more comfortable that there's folks like me, average intellect, just part of, we all got through college, life was good, and, and we didn't uh, reach the level of many of the folks in the audience today although I take nothing from them. I would have been nice to have been a Phi Beta Kappa that just wasn't offered. Um, <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, the interesting thing about Phi Beta Kappa, you know only 10% of the universities have Phi Beta Kappa chapters. And yet I was looking in the, in the, in the statistics, I was gonna say in the encyclopedia, but I just Googled it. Um, I, <laughs> that, that 17 presidents were Phi Beta Kappas, 40 Supreme Court justices were Phi Beta Kappas, and 136 Nobel laureates were Phi Beta Kappas. So those who are Phi Beta Kappas, you're pretty sharp. And how wonderful it is to be in the library's auditorium. I don't know how many of you all were around in 2009, uh, but some in this room, uh, Jim was a part of our City Hall team, uh, we got that call after seven and a half inches of rain in about 70 minutes. Uh, and Craig Buto called from the library director's office saying, we're flooding, we're flooding. And of course, we had that kind of problem uh, throughout the city, uh, the uh, underpasses, and of course, out on Third Street by U of L, people were getting flooded going under the railroad track. And I remember coming over here, and literally, I mean, it was, uh, about six to eight feet of rain as a result of that 2009 storm. And I remember standing out here and seeing all the, mo uh, the um, bookmobiles underwater. Uh, we, you could sort of look in where they had the computers, the boilers, the telephone systems. Everything was uh, underwater. This, uh, as you, many of you remember, um, I certainly do, when I was at Seneca, I used to come here on the weekends and go upstairs. That's good, Seneca High School grant. Um, uh, I used to go upstairs and do my term papers, and this, this was the children's uh, play area, a children's play area, a children's library area, which is now across the hall, and because it was, you know, the flood ruined everything, uh, we were able to generate about $11 million to redo the downstairs, to redo all of, of, uh, of what needed to be done there, as well as up here, and that created a lot of new excitement for our, our hometown. And the Library Foundation, I don't know if there are members of the Library Foundation here, but if you're not a member, you ought to be, uh, because the Library Foundation of that $11.5 million that we spent uh, redoing this, uh, this flood-afflicted uh, Carnegie Library, um, they raised about $2.5 million. And uh, they're the ones, when we opened the new library in, uh, new, in uh, Newburgh, they did uh, the raise the money for all the computers. When we uh, opened the new library in Fairdale, they did the same thing and, order, and uh, raised the money for all the computers. And as we expanded the Bon Air Center, as we redid and refurbished Western as we, uh, library branch, as we expanded uh, the Shawnee branch, as we upgraded the Crescent Hill branch, and it goes on and on, uh, the foundation, the Library Foundation is an incredibly important organization in our community. I'm not sure they get enough kudos, but every time we move forward to change what the libraries really are today, we did a strategic plan, you probably remember right after the flood, 
and that's when we came up with the game plan of, of the new ones that we needed in, in the locations where they were located, where we located them, and also in the, the new design of libraries so with more computers than books. And if you need a book, they'll bring it to your library branch the next day. Uh, but they're really they're in community centers, community rooms. And out of that strategic plan, many of you, I'm sure, remember that we made a commitment to build three regional libraries. And I bought the property on Dixie Highway, and there is a re new regional library that Mayor Fisher opened, and it's just beautiful for that neighborhood. Huge community rooms, just really wonderful. Uh, I bought the property in uh, 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 Okalona, right behind the Jefferson Mall. That's been open now, Mayor Fisher. Uh, open that. It's quite, quite beautiful and, and very, very nice and very interestingly designed because in Fairdale when we did the new branch, in Newburgh when we did the new branch, and in the two regionals that have opened thus far, we did the geothermal way of air conditioning and heating and they're very green in that regard that creates something very, very exciting. And soon we didn't have to buy the last piece of property for the third regional library because we already own the Belvoir property which is behind the Northeast Y out by uh, UPS corporate headquarters. And that's where that will be. And we'll be able to close the, Ju the Juno Drive, I think is where it is, uh, Eastern Library that will create now for the first time an opportunity for folks to enjoy. Uh, so anyway, it's just great to be in the library and it's tough to, to not at least reminisce a bit about uh, what this library has meant and how it has evolved over time and to emphasize to you that if you, if you believe, as I do, about the importance of libraries, please keep the um, Library Foundation in, in mind. You know, I, th this, this was a, a speech from you know, Louisville and <coughs> Smoketown to the White House. Uh, the Smoketown experience was about for a year and a half at my age of a year and a half, uh, where I lived above the grocery store in the uh, parking lot that is right behind United Way for those of you that remember, that was W-A-V-E, and my father and my grandfather, 40, 47 years on that corner of Preston and Jacob. And, and then we moved uh, from there uh, out into the suburbs, a place called St. Matthew's, uh, <laughs> that literally was just building up. And, and um, so, but, but I did spend a lot of time in that grocery uh, over the years, as you can imagine, with a, with a mom and dad who worked at the grocery with three aisles in that grocery. And it was a wonderful experience. I didn't realize it at the time. I thought it was a pain in the neck to come down after high school and stock shelves and work on Saturdays because uh, dad could get free labor, uh, although they were covering everything at the house. Um, but, I, but I learned about people. It gave me an opportunity. Uh, uh, Smoketown was a socioeconomically changing neighborhood from the way it was, basically blue collar working folk mostly Caucasian, and then as it began to change in Shepherd Square, I delivered groceries in Shepherd Square, I delivered groceries throughout the entire area. And it gave me a chance, as I'm sure many of you all have had, to really better understand that people are people, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're black, whether you're white, the reality is uh, you want good things for your family, for your children, you want the kind of opportunities that would be positive to create a, a quality of life for you and your family. And it gave me a chance to really learn and appreciate the differences among uh, us, those of us in Louisville and to realize that diversity plays a major role in the success of this community. We've had some difficulties, there's no question about that, but it, it plays a significant role. Well, I, I graduated from Seneca High School as the young lady who applauded, thank you. Um, she was glad I got to graduate. And, and thank you, another Seneca grad. The great thing about Seneca in those years, folks, was that Diane Sawyer was a year ahead of me. Um, and the question I'm always asked is, did you date Diane Sawyer? And the response always has been, she was an older woman, we never went out. <laughs> she, was, she was one year ahead of me at Seneca High School. And in those days, one year was a big deal. Um, so so I, I went on to college and then I went to a law school. After my first year of law school, I had the great opportunity to be asked to serve my country uh, as a member of the United States Army. And that gave me the chance to spend two years in the Army and then come back, um, to come back then to law school and finish. And what's so excited about that period is as Madeline and I, and we get to the Washington part of this talk, you know, Madeline, when we decided, yeah, we're going to go, we're going to work with President Obama after the call, she said, you know, it's sort of like you started your public service career for the federal government. 
course, I had to wear a uniform. And you are going to end your public service career with the federal government, where you get to wear a tie and jacket into the West Wing every day. And that's true. And so after college and after the military and after law school, um, I got actively involved, came home to Louisville, joined um, a law firm, and began to look at my community and meet people from all areas that I hadn't had an opportunity to meet. I, again, think that in the 50s and 60s, wherever your neighborhood was, basically were where your friends were. And when you went to Seneca High School, everybody lived in the same area. And so it gave me several years to engage through public service, excuse me, through charitable and nonprofit service and activities to meet folks from other parts of town, to really understand them and get to know them. And I always love telling the story that my deputy mayor, one of my deputy mayors, uh, Bill Summers, uh, I met Bill Summers on the board of Big Brothers and Big Sisters uh, in, in like probably 1975. And when I got elected mayor and took office in January 1986, I had never known Bill, but for that, I would not have had the opportunity to meet him. And in fact, Bill Summers became my deputy mayor with the late Joan Ream as the two deputy mayors that I had when we started in, in city government. So it gave me a chance to really meet folks around the, around the community by being active civically, et cetera. I ran for the Board of Aldermen. I got elected. Uh, I spent two two-year terms as a legislator. And one of the things that I hope you take away from this speech is, if you're not passionate about what you do, don't do it anymore. Uh, because I just decided I wasn't built to be a legislator. I'm not sure what that means, but I know that I didn't enjoy being a legislator, and so I didn't seek re-election after those two terms as a member of the Board of Aldermen. I then had the opportunity with one of the clients that our firm had, a guy named John Y. Brown, who decided he wanted to be governor of Kentucky, although I was supporting Harvey Sloan at the time, uh, we lost. Uh, I lost a lot of Harvey Sloan races in those days for governor, for senator. Uh, by the way, for those of you that remember Harvey, while, while I was at the White House, Kathy called, his wife called me, and said we're having a surprise birthday party for Harvey Sloan. And he just turned 80 years old last year and looked great, very thin. But when we surprised him, we were at a place where he had just gone into the swimming pool and uh, had sw swim, swam, swum, uh, swum, swam. He, he, did, he did that uh, in the water uh, for a, a half a mile, which, you know, 80-year-old swimming a half a mile is pretty impressive. So uh, he's alive and well, and, and as is she. They don't particularly live in the same city, but, but they are still married, and, and life is good. But John Y. Brown gets elected, and he asks me if I'd come to Frankfurt and be general counsel to the governor. And that's when he married Miss America. So it was John Y. and Phyllis Ann. It was like, you know, an amazing couple those of you that were around at the time. A lot of sizzle, a lot of excitement. Um, I don't know whether we got anything done, but a lot of sizzle, <laughs> a lot of excitement. There was a lot of energy. You know, he's the, the, the chicken king and, you know, yada, yada, yada. So I spent two, two and a half years in Frankfurt, and it was just wonderful. And I learned, I listened. Um, John, I, in fact, I told someone today over at Bellarmine, the, the one thing I remember telling him, the governor was one of those guys who would shoot from the hip. And quite often, as a businessman, he would shoot from the hip uh, over the years, and he, he was very successful. He'd hit the target. And so he felt very comfortable as, as a government leader, just sort of shooting from the hip. And one time I said, you know, I used to, I, the state trooper used to call me and say, the governor is now coming in the building. So I would just happen to walk out into the hallway and then walk with him down to his office, asking him to make a decision on this, to make a decision on that. And before I would explain the pros and cons, he'd say, yes, no, yes, no. So he was shooting from the hip. And I told him one time that, you know, sometimes you fail to clear the holster. And if you, <laughs> and that's true. I said, if you, if you fail to clear the holster, you shoot yourself in the foot, governor. So we ought to sort of take things a little slower. I'm not sure he listened. I was a kid at the time, and, but it was a very good experience. And I learned a little bit about Kentucky. And at that time, decided two and a half years was enough. I came back home and ultimately decided to run for mayor. Uh, being mayor of this community was, uh, was one of the most exciting things that had ever happened to me, other than marrying my wife, Madeline. Um, I literally, uh, my father, may he rest in peace, always said that I always wanted to be mayor. And he told, he told the story about being a 12-year-old. Uh, working at the grocery, and on the corner of Preston and Jacob, we were right across the street from the Louisville Slugger Baseball Bat Factory. Um, on the corner, there was a wicker basket. 
And so when the guys would come over, and they're mostly guys, would come over from the bat factory at lunch, and they'd get some Hostess cupcakes, they'd get a couple of slices of bologna, they'd get open some bread, and they'd make a sandwich and sit out there. They would toss the thing, toss their paper into the garbage, the trash can. Well, once in a while, the guys from the city would pick up the trash can and take it with them, the garbage guys. They wouldn't, so the next day, everybody would come, they do, and I'd have to go out there and sweep it up and all that. And I told him, I said, Dad, this is what he says, Dad, someday I'm going to be mayor of this city, and we're going to bolt down this, this garbage can <laughs> so they can't take the trash can away. I don't know whether that's true or not, but he seemed pretty excited I got elected mayor. <laughs> So I got elected mayor and it gave me a chance uh, in the old city of Louisville to, to really engage and be active uh, in so many issues regarding so many concerns. And those were the days from an economic development point of view that there were things like the Presbyterian Church issue which brought us all together. There, was no, there is no project that I ever worked on that had more people that came together uh, as you remember standing, many of you probably were there in front of the Kentucky Center for the Arts when we literally uh, filmed the, as we all sang Amazing Grace and there were priests and nuns who had signs that said, I'll convert to, to, to being <laughs> Presbyterian, come to Louisville. Uh, uh, Archbishop Kelly flew with us down to uh, make the presentation for them to come to Louisville when we were making the pitch um, uh, down in, um, uh, Biloxi, Mississippi, and uh, we were successful, and that was one of the most, if you remember, I can remember going to the grocery, and people were, it was on, the radio was on, how was the vote going to go, what was going to happen? That was an energizing moment that brought this village we call our hometown together to ultimately bring about the kind of excitement I think that uh, gave us confidence that we could do better. And of course, UPS was the biggie in terms of economic development. If you could get them to spend $2 billion, if you could create 26,000 UPS jobs, if you could ultimately attract over 175 businesses that would be here because of overnight and second day, we were ultimately going to, to be successful. Uh, of course, I had to relocate 4,000 people, uh, 127 businesses, uh, eight churches, two schools, uh, and a community center. Other than that, it was a piece of cake. Um, <laughs> the fact I ever got reelected was amazing. Uh, but those were the kinds of things that, that at least I found to be very exciting. And, and I, as you remember, uh, when I got elected and took office in 86, the Constitution of, of Kentucky said, the mayor of Louisville shall have one term. And one of the things I think held this community back is the fact that for, since 1890, the mayor of the city of Louisville had one term. So you learned where the men's room was, they were all guys, the first, the first year, and then you'd be mayor for two years, and then you'd be looking to run for something else. And I think that helped, personally, I think that held us back. Well, I, I was elected, the uh, legislature put on the ballot to change that part of the Constitution. It was put in the Constitution to ensure that a Tammany Hall kind of political machine would never be created or allowed to be created in the major cities of Kentucky. It wasn't just the city of Louisville that couldn't succeed itself. It was Lexington and Covington and some of these other horrible, horrible places called cities that the rural legislature in 1890 wanted to make sure that we literally could not, uh, could not. <laughs> what I do? My key, my key, my kingdom for a key. I mean, um, <laughs> that, that's the closest I ever got to a five eight Kappa <laughs> Uh So, <laughs> so, um, so it so it passed, and I and I I got the opportunity to have two additional terms, and one of the things that I decided was that um, I needed to stay there. I needed to think about problems, plan to solve those problems, develop an imp implementation implementation program to solve the problems, and then be there to implement it and be there to cut the ribbon. And to do that, you got to have more than one term. And so I stayed the three full terms. And actually, for, since I never got indicted, they gave me another year. <laughs> I got 13 years as mayor in the first time, rather than 12. It really had nothing to do with not being indicted. It had to do with the fact that they changed the cycle of elections. And four-year terms got a fifth-year term, two-year terms got a three-year term, so that we would be on a different cycle uh, election time. So I went out. And as I went out and went back to making a living, 
because I had promised my wife at some point I would. Um, for those four years, that's when we worked as a community to consolidate our city and county government. And it was, for those of you who have been through it several times, looking in this room, you probably were there for the twice, two times in the 80s. Uh, obviously, in the late 60s, we failed. Nashville passed it. Indianapolis passed it. Um, Jacksonville passed it. All three very vibrant cities happened to be state capitals, which play a role. But still, they were able to speak as one. Um, and we were successful uh, to this time in terms of consolidating city government. So the question then became, who was going to be the mayor of the new expanded city? We went from a city of, I think we were ranked 68th uh, in the country, and we went to, uh, to the city that was ranked 16th in the country with about 740,000 people. And I figured that I had the best chance to make the least amount of mistakes, and maybe people would give me a chance to put it together. And I did have the chance to do that, although I'm sure I made some mistakes. I had the best chance to make the least amount of mistakes. That's all I promised. And it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't as easy as it looked. We, we took as the symbol of the new city the, the duck, because we wanted you as constituents to just see us float across that lake as comfortable as possible, when in fact we were paddling like hell to stay afloat. And we were paddling like hell because the telecommunication system didn't work. So the old county police cars couldn't talk to the old city ambulances, and the old county ambulances couldn't talk to the new city fire department. Uh, we needed a new communication system. We needed a new financial management system. We needed a new PeopleSoft system for our, pub, uh, for our personnel. And it was uh, interesting uh, to work through that process. Um, uh, and then, of course, we had all the great opportunities to take the two police departments that had disliked, I'll be kind, disliked each other uh, for maybe 100 years and told them they should clasp hands, join in two, two people in a car and sing Kumbaya, we are one. Um, you know, they, the old county cops thought the old city cops were crooks. The old city cops thought the old county cops weren't cops. They just were handling, handling traffic accidents. And that was the kind of confrontation. And so then we had to have the argument. What argument you say, you say would be so, so difficult? Well, you know, the county had a stripe on its pants in the police department, and the city didn't have a stripe on its pants. So should we or should, not we, or should we not have a stripe? I, this is honest to God truth. I'm, you know, and, and, and we did the same thing with EMS, and what were the color of the ambulances going to be? And I literally went out of town, and they painted them gray. That was the mistake. They should have been much brighter, much e more easily uh, noticed. But what happens when you go out of town? You know, guys make decisions, gals make decisions, and you get a paint job on these ambulances that we're having to live with uh, beyond, in my judgment, beyond the, the, the best that we, we could have. So anyway, I, I did all that, and I was getting ready to, so now we've merged, and now we've come together, and we are one, and we're trying to let the suburban areas know that, that, that we are one, and we have more in common. You know, we used to talk about this community as a patchwork quilt. And if there were a problem, if, there, if it were fraying in one corner or the other of this patchwork quilt, the entire quilt was in jeopardy. And so, you know, it takes a village. We got to all pull together and we got to get whatever the problem is where it's fraying. We got to get it resolved before it literally takes over and unravels the entire quilt. That was the, that was the way we presented it. And so we went about trying to do that. Some people pushed back on us a little bit uh, during that merger, but, but we went through it. So I'm getting to run, so I ran for election and I ran for election, and so now we've got 21 years as mayor, and I'm getting ready to run for my sixth and final time, and Jim McGovern calls me and says, you know, you, you, you ought to do something else. <laughs> no, no, he really didn't. I get a call from Governor Bashir, who was a longtime buddy and a 30-year friend, I chaired his campaign when he first ran for governor 27 years ago. We lost. Uh, and um, literally, I, uh, he said, why don't you come and help me in, with cities and counties around the state? So my wife was kind enough to say, it'll be a new challenge. Let's see what we can do. And we said we'd do it. So I did not run for a sixth term. We ran with the governor, traveled all over the state. Madeline and I can tell you stories of where to eat and where not to eat around this state. <laughs> I will tell you one thing, one, one lesson that I learned, and I made a commitment that, uh, that to myself and to, my, to anybody who would listen. I will never stay 
in another hotel with a number on it. Whether it's Hotel 8, Hotel 6, Hotel 5, I will never stay in maybe 21C, but never, <laughs> never Hotel 6. And I remember Hazard, Kentucky one time where I was staying in a Hotel 8 and we came, I knew there was problems because everything in my room was bolted down. And I, and I remember going to see the mayor and saying to her, you know, what's the deal? And well, you know, it, you know, we're not in Louisville. And I said, no, I understand that. But I mean, and so I get up in, for breakfast uh, to, to then leave and go wherever we were going next. And they had Fox on the uh, TV in the, in the lobby and where you had a cup of coffee and a sweet roll. And so I said to the lady, who was there, I said, um, can, can you change the station? <laughs> and she said, no. <laughs> no, we're not changing. I said, I'll take CNN just to be neutral. I don't not, I'm not looking for MSNBC. So anyway, Kentucky was interesting. Now, the reason why you run, the reason why you run for lieutenant governor of this state is not because you have any job to do, because the Constitution literally says there will be a lieutenant governor, and the lieutenant governor no longer runs the Senate, no longer presides over the Senate, nor does the lieutenant governor have any specific duties other than every two weeks he gets paid. <laughs> it's a heck of a job, folks. So obviously, going in with Steve, uh, I said, I don't want to do this unless I'm really going to be engaged. And, and that's when uh, I took two portfolios, the economic development portfolio with one of my former uh, Deputy Mayors Larry Hayes, as well as the education portfolio, working with community colleges and universities, as well as public schools around the country, uh, around the state. I always got confused. When I was in the White House, I'd say state, and they'd say, no, you're talking about the country now. And so we, we, we did, for those of you who might have worked with us in, in the, some of the troubled schools here in town, we had a program called Close the Deal that would give these young people an opportunity to get their finances ready to go to college and literally to have colleges uh, work with them to be able to get them ready. I did that all throughout the state, at schools throughout the state. But again, why does someone run for lieutenant governor? They run for lieutenant governor to run for governor. You, know, you got four years to do nothing, or eight, to simply go and organize, set up your game plan, get your precinct captains in line, or go stop by all the newspapers, all the TV stations, let them know who you are, and that you're ready to take the reins. One of the things that hit me after about two and a half years, sitting through budgets with the governor, where we were cutting budgets over and over again as a result of the uh, worst financial crisis this country had seen since the Great Depression, was that the issues that I was dealing with uh, at, the, uh, at the state level were just not of interest to me. And I, I told all the folks at the White House, a lot of the young folks uh, as we were leaving, that you've got to find something that you're passionate about. And if you're not passionate about it, then it becomes a real job, and that's all it is. And if you're passionate about it, it's not a job. It's something that you truly are energized about when you awake in the morning and you're ready to go to work. And I just couldn't get fired up about being K Kentucky's governor. Not that I could have won a Democratic primary, not that I could have won the election. But the point is, after about two and a half years, uh, I decided I didn't want to be governor. Well, I had a public uh, press conference, and I, and I told folks that so that everybody who wants to run for governor would know the lieutenant governor was not running. And I continued to do what I, what I did. Governor Bashir came to me and said, you know, we've got an opening to lead the community college system in Kentucky. Would you consider that? And I spent a lot of time. Uh, looking at our 16 community colleges, I had visited most, if not all, by that time in two and a half years or three years or so. And I realized that, yeah, it would be great and it paid really well. But the reality was that all I'd be doing is managing 16 presidents of, university, of, of community colleges. And I really wanted to work with young people in the education field. So I said no. Within three weeks, I get a call from the White House. Now, there's a fellow who had my position at the White House who calls out of the blue and says, I'm leaving. And I said, oh, I'm so disappointed because he was a really good, he is a really good guy. I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm going to take my Rolodex and all the mayors and county officials and governor, you know what a Rolodex is, right? Because <laughs> I can't tell you the number of young people at the White House who had no idea. <laughs> they would come in and they look at my office and say, what does that thing do? 
So, I, so he said, I'm taking my Rolodex. I think I'm hot. I got three little kids. Now's the time to make it. I'm going to Wall Street. I'm going to make seven figures because the Wall Street group is, is wanting to do public-private partnerships with governors and mayors and county officials, public-private partnerships to build roads, bridges, et cetera. And I said, well, you know, I'm really sorry to hear that, but while you're up in New York, if you hear of anybody that's got any of those seven-figure starting salaries of a million dollars or more, you give me a call and let me know. So he hung up, and within a couple of days thereafter, he called up and said, I got a better idea. He said, why don't you take my job? And I said, look, um, uh, the reality is, is that I have been mayor or, or a state official, starting with Ronald Reagan. And I have dealt with the position he held and I ultimately took in every one of those administrations, Republican and Democrat. And I said, the one thing I can tell you across the board is that the White House never listens to anybody at the state or local level. I mean, we tell them things, they never listen. They just lecture. We ask them questions, they answer, and then they tell us what we should do. They never listen. And I said, so I have really, I got, a, I got another year as lieutenant governor. I got a desk. I got a chair. I get a check every two weeks. I'm in, I'm in heaven. So he said, no, no, you, you ought to come up and see. So I said to my wife, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, she said, you ought to go up and check it out. So the next day I got a call from Valerie Jarrett, who is the, who was a, a very close friend prior to the apprentice president becoming president, and was still the only one of everyone in the West Wing that followed him up to the private quarters, to the personal quarters at night, saying, you should come and visit. We'd like to talk to you. So we went. And I went and I, and I told Valerie Jarrett that they never listened, that Dennis McDonough was the chief of staff. We went on the South Lawn and walked around. Sometimes you see the picture of Dennis and President Obama walking around the driveway on the South Lawn. He did that every night about 5.30, quarter to six. That was the wrap-up time for the president of how the day went and what should happen the next day. Not that the president was done working, but that was the wrap-up opportunity, or Dennis was done working. Uh, but, and, and I walked and, they, and I said, nobody listens, and they said, yeah, it's a new day. You're gonna, you can come to any meeting on the domestic issues that are being held. You, we want your input. You can come to any meeting on the domestic agenda, obviously except for the ones held in the Oval where you have to be invited. Okay. So I came home and I said to Madeline, you know, if in fact, if in fact what they're saying is true, I really had some pretty good experiences. I think I could help the administration. Well, within two or three days thereafter, the phone rings. I pick it up. They said, Jerry Abramson. I said, yes. They said, can you hold for the President of the United States? I said, no, I'm busy. Can you have him call me? <laughs> <laughs> so there he is on the phone, you know, and he said, it's the fourth quarter. We just got a little under two and a half years left. It's fourth quarter, and it was right after the was it the Seattle uh, um, Super Bowl game where Seattle either won it or lost it in the last couple of minutes of the, of the Super Bowl? And he said, you know, a lot can get done in the last quarter of a football game, and you need to think in terms of coming up, we need you. Well, what do you say? So you salute, and you, and you soldier on, as I, as I learned. And uh, a week later, I announced I was leaving the lieutenant governor's position. And then two weeks later, um, I was in Washington. My wife and I went up to D.C. We spent one day looking at seven potential apartments. We found an apartment, 800 square feet, <laughs> twice the mortgage that we are still paying. <laughs> uh, so it wasn't a big money maker to go to Washington. I don't want anybody to think I got rich. Uh, tw twice the mortgage. And, but it was a 12-minute walk uh, f to the White House every morning, so I didn't have a car. And I was able to, I lived on, on what is known as the West End, which is the uh, north side of Pennsylvania Avenue, 24th Street. On the south side of Pennsylvania Avenue is Smoky, Bo uh, Smoky uh, Foggy Bottom, Smoky Bottom, Foggy Bottom of the State Department. So I walked right down Pennsylvania Avenue and it worked out great. So there I am. So I'm showing, I'm getting up at, uh, Madeline is here and we're trying to get together once a month if we can. Um, Sydney, our son, is here and, and, and I'm there in this apartment by myself. That's 800, did I mention it was 800 square feet? <laughs> it's about as big as this stage. Um, and so, uh, so I'm happy, you know, I'm happy. Um, 
so I'm walking in the morning. We had senior staff every morning at 7 o'clock in the morning. Every morning, 7 o'clock in the morning. So I'm getting up at 545, and I'm there. Senior staff in the Roosevelt Room, I got a seat, specific location. I'm with Valerie Jarrett, who is my boss, and the chief of staff, Dennis McDonough, runs the meeting. And we go through, in about 15 minutes, literally what the day is like from a media perspective, from a policy, legislative perspective, et cetera. And then I would move on to meet with Valerie for about 15 minutes in terms of what we were doing with my team. And my team was broken down on people that were working on cities, young people, that, and I say young, they were all extremely bright, extremely well-credentialed 28-year-olds, 31-year-olds. And so I had cities, counties, then I had some that were working on state, and I had two young ladies <coughs> who were uh, working on tribal issues because the uh, Indian tribes were in my portfolio. And literally, I had about 18 people working with me, and the day would begin, and the issues would start. And, you know, my job was to understand what was going on and to be able to interact when we needed mayors to help or county officials to help, or et cetera, or governors to help. And so, you know, it was issues like, um, uh, you know, Obamacare. It was time for sign-up, you know, back when we were really trying to help people sign up. And so I would... So I would call the mayor of St. Paul and I'd say, you know, you got any ideas? Because you're a pretty creative guy. And he said, yeah, we're going to open up our libraries on Saturday. We're going to have a navigator at every one of the libraries uh, in, uh, Minnesota, in, in St. Paul, Minnesota. I got Minneapolis to do the same thing on Saturdays. And we're going to literally have navigators that help people who need to get on, get on, whether it be Medicaid, the expanded Medicaid, or whether it, it, it was to get on the insurance group itself. Um, and so I would take that idea and I'd begin to work with mayors around the country to do the same thing. The mayor of Tampa came up with a great idea of giving out fans to every church so that when you went into to your church in, in Tampa, you'd get yourself a fan. One side it would say something positive, I guess, and the other side it would say, here's how you get uh, enrolled in Obamacare. You know, and so we worked through those kinds of issues. We created competition among cities. The ones that had the second time, second year I was there, the ones that got the largest increase, we guaranteed them a visit by the president. Milwaukee was the one that won. We got an Air Force One, which is, is a nice ride, by the way. We got an Air Force One, and we flew to Milwaukee. The president uh, thanked the, the mayor and the county executive who had worked on getting an expanded Obamacare uh, group squared away. And, and it was those kinds of issues. It was, it was issues like Vietnam veteran, uh, not Vietnam, but veterans homelessness, where the first lady came into my office and, and she said, we, got, we have been meeting with these wives of, of vets and they're saying their husbands and their former husbands who came back from the war are underneath the, the, the overpasses in their hometowns and they're homeless and it's difficult and I want to get a program going that'll respond to just that. Well, who's going to do it? Cities are going to do it. Mayors are going to do it. County officials are going to do it. So we got the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the National League of Cities and we started a program. And literally there are cities in this country that set up an entire system, Houston being by far the best, that literally got to the point where every, every veteran, every veteran that was homeless had an opportunity to get into four walls and a ceiling, wrap around uh, services, you know how that works at the, at the U United Way, and uh, literally created an opportunity for for the chance to be able to make a difference. Those were the kinds of things that we did. The Zika virus came into effect. And the next thing you know, I'm working with the CDC down in Atlanta, and we're calling the governors of all the states along the southern borders. We're calling the boards of health at all the major cities like Houston and Dallas and, and Miami, et cetera, to get them, Louisiana, Baton Rouge, to get them to a CDC conference in Atlanta that we set up to explain what Zika was, to explain what it could be and how we needed to move aggressively to be prepared and to be, to be up, to, up to speed. Uh, the same thing happened with Trans-Pacific Partnership. That was where the President of uh, America spent almost seven years negotiating with 11 other countries. It was 12 of us that would have uh, redone NAFTA because Canada in the Trans-Pacific Partnership and Mexico were now in this new group. It also included Japan and Australia, Vietnam, Peru, etc. Uh, in Kentucky, as an example, I was calling governors on behalf of the TPP. In Kentucky, as an example, $10 billion worth of trade occurs with those 11 countries today with the tariffs in place. 
Can you imagine what tomorrow would be if you took down the tariffs and the materials and the agriculture products and the manufactured goods and the distilled spirits that we're sending around the world from Kentucky would no longer have a tariff and how many more things would be able to be, to be sold? Perfect example is the escape made out here at Fort Knox. The escape in Australia carried a 35% tariff. The RAV4, which is a Toyota vehicle, if it were made in Japan and brought into Australia, it carried no tariff. So now you want to buy a small SUV, you're going to buy a RAV4 at 35% less in cost than, than the Ford Escape. The answer is you're going to buy the RAV4. Drop the tariffs, I would submit to you the guys and gals out at Ford here can compete once you have a level playing field and sell a lot more cars. So I'm calling governors, I'm talking to the governor of Iowa, where where soybean and wheat and corn and all the things that are up there that are their major exports, he thought would triple in terms of the opportunities for his farm communities. And so what am I asking them to do? Call their senators. You know, they're holding up the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Call their senators. Let them know what it means. And you call mayors. The number one largest city that exports uh, to these countries in America happens to be Houston. A lot has to do with gas and oil, oil. Uh, natural gas and things, and so call the mayor, ask her to call her senators, you know, try to engage and get them involved. So those are the kinds of things that I did. It gave me a chance to travel with the vice president on Air Force Two from time to time when he would speak or when he would go to uh, activities, and it gave me a chance to travel on Air Force One. I had the chance during, you know, we're, we're in this forest fire period right now going on out in California. Two years ago, I got my first invitation to the Situation Room at the White House. And I really got sort of, you know, I felt sort of peculiar because I always thought the Situation Room was when, you know, the bombs are coming in and, you, and you're, you're in there with the military. I, what I didn't realize was when we were going to talk with nine West, Western governors, California, Oregon, Washington, where, the, where the, um, fire, the, the wildfires were occurring and the drought was occurring, we went into the Situation Room. We had the nine governors up on the wall. We had the president sitting at the head of the table. Valerie Jarrett was here. I was here. We had FEMA. We had Homeland Security, all the folks. And the president was interacting with them about, are we doing everything we can to help you governors in fighting these forest fires, in handling this drought? And so those were the kinds of things that, that we worked through. Now, the great story about that is that that's the first time I realized that there are three buildings, there are three uh, situation rooms, not just one. There is the big one, the John F. Kennedy Situation Room. It seats about 20, 20 folks at the table and about 20 around. But there are, in fact, two other situation rooms. And as a result, there is sort of a, a, um, a center right in the middle where the Secret Service sits. And when you walk into the Situation Room, they say, which, you know, which meeting are you here for? And then they direct you to one of the three rooms. Well, what happened at that first Situation Room experience that I had was I noticed that at every one of the uh, seats, there was a leather coaster. And it said, White House Situation Room on it. So I thought, I looked around, everybody was gone. <laughs> so I picked it up. And I walked out to the kiosk in the middle. And I said to the Secret Service guy who came up, I said, can I take this? And he grabbed it from me, he said, you can't take that. <laughs> and I said, I said, I can't believe I'm the first person that was in a situation room and literally said, and took one of those. He said, no, you are not the first person, but you are the first person who ever asked <laughs> if you could take it. And then he flipped up my pocket and he put it in my pocket and I walked in. Yeah. And the other, the other really fun uh, experience that I had was um, at Camp David. You know, I don't know how many of you realize, but Camp David uh, really was not created until World War II. Uh, and it was because prior to World War II, you know, Washington was built on a swamp. And so it's hot and it's humid, it's horrible. And so they would put the president on a boat out on the Potomac, and they would take him out through the Baltimore Harbor, out into the Atlantic, to get some wind, to get some breeze. Well, that World War II starts, and the Secret Service said, Mr. President, we're not taking you out off the coast because of the U-boats and the potential problems with the Germans, uh, Germany. And so um, 
the decision was made to try to find a location within, I don't know, it took us two hours to drive there. He goes 10 minutes by helicopter. And, and, and it had to be at a certain elevation so you'd get some wind. Uh, and it would be a, a, a resting place, a place to be able to get away. And so they found this old WPA, CCC kind of place, and they began to work it up and develop it. And they've got some of the small cottages that were there back in the old days. Um, and literally, it, it was open to FDR. And FDR named it, anybody know? Shangri-La. That's exactly right, because of Aldous Huxley's book and Shangri-La being heaven and wonderful and, you know, Valhalla and all that. Not the golf course. Though. So, <laughs> So we, we went in there, and, and the president has a beautiful, a beautiful uh, home with a swimming pool in the back and a single uh, par three hole with three tee boxes. So you can go from 90 yards, 110 yards, 120 yards. And equidistant from the two are two cottages, and that was where Begin and, and uh, 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 the, 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 uh, Arafat, Arafat, no, not Arafat, Sadat, Sadat. Uh, literally, I mean, that you could mark, you could walk it off. They were exactly the same steps from the president. It's the only place that I've been that has a basketball court with a presidential seal in the middle, where it's, you know, usually have the Cardinals or UK uh, or Bellarmine. Uh, and it, it has a wonderful swimming pool with six or eight lanes. It's got uh, horseshoe pits for the, the bushes from the old days. Um, but I'll tell you one interesting story and t mentioning, and I, I know I'm getting late. I know, my wife's giving me the thing. <laughs> last story, last story. Last, st you okay? Thank you, Wayne. Wayne Perky, you're the man. Um, I'm sitting, I, I went for a meeting one time out there and I, I was, we break for lunch and I didn't really want to have lunch so I'd taken a magazine and I walked over and sat on one of the cottage uh, rocking chairs. And the Navy runs uh, uh, Camp David just like they run the, the White House mess. And so the Navy guy comes by and he said, you know where you're sitting? And I said, no, where am I? Uh, yeah, I said, I know where I'm sitting. I'm, he said, no, no. He said, that's where Churchill and FDR had a conversation on that porch for the first time talking about the planning of D-Day. And that's where you begin to go, oh, oh my gosh. But it got, even, it got even more incredible. You know, you remember with Sadat and Begin, they had an agreement Carter brought him to the White House. They shook hands. You remember all that? Well, literally, they had been there for two weeks. This is where the Sinai was given back to the Egyptians uh, to be able to bring peace uh, between the two, etc. cetera. And um, literally, the, the, the deal, it was the last night. They had been there for four or five days, and uh, Begin wouldn't sign. He just he wasn't going to go uh, with the agreement. So. Carter was, this is, there's a, there's a letter, a handwritten memo from Carter on the wall in this, in this room that's round where they could all sit around a round table. And it says, Carter, Carter uh, said, okay, I guess this is it. We've done everything we can. We're not going to be able to bring about peace between Israel and Egypt. And the president, so, so Begin turns to him and said, Mr. President, before I leave, uh, could you sign um, a picture of the two of us, I guess they'd taken a lot of photos throughout the four or five days, that I could give to my grandchildren. And, and uh, President Carter said, of course I will, of course I can. And uh, Begin said, okay, you know, my grandchildren's name is Sarah and Rachel and Rebecca, whatever, you know, the Bible. So he says, okay, so he gives them the pictures. And um, President signs and sends them back to, uh, Secret Service takes them back to Begin's cottage. And Begin opens it up, and, the let, and, and what it says is, Dear Sarah, it is so unfortunate that your grandfather was unwilling to bring about peace. <laughs> Begin began to cry, picked up the phone, called President Carter, and said, I'll sign. And that's all up on this wall. I mean, it's just, it was incredible. So now I'm at Bellarmine. I'm teaching a junior level course in public finance. I'm teaching a comparative a leadership class, and I'm teaching, I'll be team teaching an MBA class on innovation with David Jones Jr. and Sharon Carrick. Um, and I'm also uh, developing, and we will have our first uh, leadership training program 
for 30 mayors and county executives from throughout uh, Kentucky coming into Bellarmine in December. So it has been a wonderful experience. Uh, Louisville, Kentucky to the White House uh, was a great ride, uh, but being home is as good as it gets. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you all. As I mentioned at the beginning, we do have some note cards for people who have questions who would like Mayor Abramson to answer. And I have a few I've received already, but I'm going to stand right here to your left. And if you would bring them up, we'll get in as many as we can. The first question, since we know the mayor is uh, a political person, is what do you think the Democrats could do in 2018 and 2020 to get back into a leadership position? You know, I, I will tell you, I'm not sure it's just enough to be unhappy with the president. I think it's going to take, I think that takes us darn close to the goal line, but I think we're still at about the eight yard line. We're not across the goal line by just getting people who are so uncomfortable with the, uh, uh, for lack of a better way to say it, peculiarness of our present president. Um, I, think, I think Democrats are, uh, first thing, I think people are going to have to wonder whether there's a place for political parties anymore. I think there's a discussion that's going to take place in this country, much like what happened in France with Macron, where literally the, the basic parties that had been running France forever and ever all lost, and he created something that was different and created something that was more vibrant and obviously energized the French electorate to vote. So I think there'll be some discussion come 2020 about just that concept. You know, what does it mean to be a Democrat? I can define what I think it means. What does it mean to be a Republican? I think many could do the same. But is, is it really that important anymore? Or, can, or can we, is there a better approach? I think that, that, that's really important. I think we're going to have to have a very clear economic message uh, to be able to give people a, a confidence that we're going to bring about change. I think change is the name of the game. We saw that. Uh, I finished Hillary's book a couple of uh, nights ago. Uh, I would recommend you read it. Uh, and if you can't read the whole book, I certainly would read the last three chapters, which I think are really powerful. Um, but I think that, that we have got to get people to think in terms of reality and what we can accomplish and how we can accomplish it by increments moving forward rather than by swings to the right or swings to the left. That's not where this country is. I think we are basically a center-right country. That, that's my thinking. I think from time to time we get a center-left president like President Clinton and President Obama. But I do believe uh, that, that you hear from people, at least I do, uh, of their concern with the present situation the lack of, of um, uh, the, the lack of being presidential in the way he handles himself, the things that he says uh, with his with his uh, uh, Twitter account uh, that has just frightened the world around us, um, and the the his lack of awareness of some of these issues that, as he said on health care, you know, it's really complicated, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's really complicated. Talk to the guys who spent a year guys and gals who were in the House and the Senate who spent a year, almost a year and a, and a quarter, working through what ultimately became the Affordable Care Act. And oh, by the way, the Affordable Care Act, which is 1,000, 1,600 pages, is very similar in length to Medicare and Social Security legislation. The difference is that after two or three, four years under the legislation of Medicare and of Social Security, they were reopened, brought back to Congress. They realized these worked really well, and they, they, they expanded whatever those were. They realized these were mistakes. They, they took them out and replaced them with some other aspect of it. We've not had that opportunity under affordable health care. There are significant areas that need to be changed. There were mistakes that were made in a document that, that, that large. But 
unlike Social Security, unlike Medicare, where everybody got a second chance to look at the experience of three or four years and then change it accordingly, nothing has happened and we have to live with the mistakes. Yes, sir. You, oh, that microphone's not working? Another question. What can young people do to change the political division in our country and bring us all together? Well, first thing, they got to vote. I mean, I am just... You know, I, I, I meet all these young millennials, and, and they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. And all you got to look is at statistics. I mean, when you lose an election by 22,000 votes in Wisconsin, when there was a couple million cast, you know, and you see the numbers of young folks that didn't turn out, and in Pennsylvania, and in Ohio, and in Kentucky, as an example, you begin to say that there is a role. Civic engagement is what is needed in America today more than ever before. And let me tell you what President Obama told us all. I don't know how many of you all, uh, a couple of days after the election, saw the picture. It was in the Washington Post, it was in the New York Times. He came out to speak to the West Wing uh, staff in the Rose Garden, and there was a group of us over on the side that you thought we had all, all of us lost our mothers or dads that day. I mean, the look on the faces were so despondent. The president quoted Louis Brandeis, who, unlike what the president thought when I brought him in to speak here in Louisville, and we passed by Brook and Breck on the expressway, and I said, Mr. President, that's where Louis Brandeis went to school, at Louisville Mayo High School. And he said, oh, no, no, he's from Massachusetts. I said, Mr. President, with all due respect, I, I know. So he quoted Louis Brandeis, and, and what he said as we were all getting ready, you know, a month later, a month and a half later to leave, he quoted Louis Brandeis, who said, the most important public position in this country is the position of private citizen. And the president was saying to all of us, wherever you're going, whatever you're going to do, you are still, as Brandeis would say, holding a very important high-level position the position of private citizen in the United States of America. And to be able to make that mean something, you at least have to vote. But that is a minimum. You have got to engage. You have got to understand the system. Not pro-Democrat, not pro-Republican, not right or left. We used to, when I was Lieutenant Governor, business groups would come to Frankfurt. You know, leadership Louisville, leadership Lexington, leadership Northern Kentucky, leadership Bowling Green. And I would speak to them, and I would ask them at the conclusion, these are all the leaders of the community. I would ask them, talking about civic engagement, how many of you know who your state legislator or state senator is? And you'd get about 40%. And then I'd ask the really, the really important question, because these are really important people. How many of you know who your school board members are, who are the ones shaping the young people who ultimately will lead this country in the future. And we were always, in every community that I asked that question, we were always in single digits at best. So if you don't know who your state legislator is, if you don't know who your state senator is, if you don't know who your county commissioner is out in the state, or you don't know who your metro council member is, you can't engage. And they become independent contractors. That's all they are. Because they have, they're not fiduciaries representing you because you've never taken the time to let them know what you think. Because you don't know who they are. And I'll tell you the worst example I can give you on this. You remember when the, uh, Governor Bashir and I thought it was really important once and for all on this casino thing to get it off the table. Every two years we talked about it, nothing ever happened. So the best way to get it off the table we thought was to put it on the ballot. Let the people of Kentucky decide. If you want it, let's do it. If you don't want it, we're not talking about it ever again. It's over. House of Representatives passed it. State Senate of Kentucky decided that they didn't trust the people that elected them, and they voted no. You shall not have the right to vote on that issue. So I come back to Louisville the next weekend. I bump into four business guys, very successful business guys, who are bemoaning the fact, can you believe that they wouldn't let us vote? And I said to the four of them, who are your senators and did you contact them? And they said, who, who, who is our senator? And I said, well, where do you live? I knew 
darn well where they lived. All four of them lived in the same district. All four of them had the same, same st state senator, and she voted no. Now, these guys are moaning and moaning uh, about this thing where they had never engaged. There was no civic act activity. There, the person that voted, represented them in Frankfurt, voted no. And yet they're all screaming and yelling about, I can't believe it, I can't believe it. So things happen. Government moves on. And if people don't engage, you're going to be left behind. And that's what really frightens me, especially with the millenniums. They have got to get involved, and they have got to understand that it affects their lives today, tomorrow, and for years to come. Another question, since you are now a Louisvillean and not a Washingtonian, what do you think are Louisville's biggest problems and how would you solve them? Oh. <laughs> I'm not going there. I'm not going there. I, I will tell you this. It's going to take everybody to get involved. We know what the problems are in this community. We know what the issues are in this community, whether it's it's uh, the issue of, of, of neighborhoods or public safety or education. We understand what they are. All you got to do is give a darn and roll up your sleeves, especially the boomers who are checking out left and right. I mean, I don't understand the boomers who have been so engaged in making a difference in this country. The boomers who are the age group of, that I see in this room today and myself who have literally said back when we were in our 20s, we're going to change the world. They have, they have just clocked out. They have walked on and they're playing golf. They're just not getting anything done. I'm, I'm disappointed that that's occurring. And as a result, to solve the kind of problems that any city has, um, we have got to engage. You've got to engage with the elementary school around the corner or the middle school or the high school. You've got to engage with your school board or your city council person. You've got to let your state legislator know that the issues that they are supposedly against us on in Frankfurt, the anti-Louisville stuff, you've got to let them know that you're expecting them to defend this community in Frankfurt. And you're going to hold them accountable. I don't care whether they're Democrats or Republicans. Those are the kinds of things that get people's attention. Uh, I, I gave you a great example about engagement. I, I get three presidents of universities, three uh, senior kids, students, from three public universities in Kentucky. They come up to Lexington because there was a proposal uh, that was going to cut the amount of money going to public universities. And they said, we can't do that. we got to stop that. And I, they said, Lieutenant Governor, what, what we need, we're going to have a rally, and we want you to speak at that rally in the rotunda. I said, I'm not going to the rotunda to speak at a rally. And you guys are wasting your time standing in the rotunda to, to, to have a rally. I said, here's what you do. you got Christmas break coming up. I said, you, get to, you said all the public universities are all engaged and all the presidents of the universities, the kids, the student presidents are engaged. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, then you take the time to figure out every state legislative district and every state senate district. And you find somebody that lives in those districts for as, from as many of those public universities as you can. And you take those five or six people and you ask to meet with the state rep or the state senate senator in your district. And you ask to meet with them, and then you meet with them and say, look, if you cut, we're going to lose these classes. If I lose these classes, I'm going to have to go five years to college to get my degree instead of four. You can't do it. He said, well, that's a good idea. So we should cancel the rally. I said, yeah, cancel the rally. <laughs> and so that's exactly what they did. And they got three to seven, he told me afterwards, uh, people in every district, no matter where you were living in Kentucky, there was somebody that had gone to Western or Eastern or Northern or UL, UK. They went in, they met with the state rep or the senator at his or her home or his or her business. And you know what? The legislation was defeated. That's the way you engage. You, you, you care enough about to get out of your comfort zone and go knock on a door and make some things happen. It's time for one final question, and that is what is the biggest surprise, either good or bad, that you saw when you worked in Washington? You know, the, the, 
the, the thing that was, I'll never forget going into the Oval Office the first time. You know, you just sort of walk in and you want, you want so badly to look at the paintings on the walls and you want to look at the sculpture, the Remington over on the side and the, and yet, you know, you're trying to be cool. You're just, uh, <laughs> just, you know, you, you've been called in by the boss and you just, yes, sir, no, sir, it's great to be here. We might as well be in the hallway as far as I know. Um, I thought, I saw people who were strong as new rope walk into that Oval Office and just turned into mush. I mean, there is some incredible strength in that office that I, I'm not sure I really realized. I also will say this. I, I made the comment about young people. I have never seen, uh, and I've told some of my own staff from my days as mayor, I've never seen a brighter group of young men and women, a more passionate group of young men and women, who believed in what they were doing and were willing to work there at, I mean, I'd, I'd leave at 7.30, quarter to eight, pizzas were just coming in, the kids were gearing up for another three hours of, of work. I have never seen such a commitment of young people. And they were kids from all over the country. I say kids, uh, late 20s, early 30s, they were young people from all over the country. And they were credentialed to the hilt from Stanford and Yale and Harvard, da, 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 da. Um, but what, what the vice president said to me one time, he said, you know, you and I ought to hang out more together because we're the two oldest guys in the West Wing. <laughs> and every, every now and then, what I found was a little experience and a little gray hair would give you an opportunity to be sitting in a room with all these hard-charging Princeton, you know, uh, Dartmouth, University of Chicago, Stanford people, and bring something to their attention that they de never had a clue about uh, I'll, I'll give you one example and then we'll end. Uh, the president proposed in 2015, uh, based on the 100 year plus experience that we've had in this country of free public education, that, uh, which he thought was the, the predicate upon which the success of America was based, that we all had first grade through 12th grade, he thought we ought to have an additional two years. And he made that proposal in his State of the Union. You should have two additional free, free years. You could have go to community college, you get a two-year associate degree, you can go on to a four-year college, you can really make money and get your certificate as a plumber or an electrician and, and just go out and make some big money. You can do whatever you want, but you ought to have that opportunity for free. So about a week or two or three later, uh, day, days later, I get a call from the legislative group that's writing the legislation. We sent it up to Frankfurt, uh, up to uh, Capitol Hill, and obviously nothing happened. Uh, but we said, so we're sitting in there and they're talking about, oh, this and that. And I raised my hand and I said, let me ask you this. What about, are we paying for remedial education? And there was this hush, just like in this room. And it was, you know, it was like this Princeton guy looking to the Harvard guy saying, what is remedial education? What, <laughs> you know, what are, what are they talking about? And I said, you know, I looked into community colleges, as I think I mentioned to you earlier, and a significant number of young people, and not so young people, going to community college in Kentucky, need a remedial class in English or need a remedial class in math to get into Math 101 and, and uh, 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 English 101. And if we're not covering the tuition for the remedial class, you might as well forget it, because that could be as high as 40% in some states simply don't have the ability, don't have the educational experience or, or uh, academic experience ready to go forward. And they went, ah, uh ah. -huh. <laughs> so we put that in. Now, we sent it up to Capitol Hill and because we were for it, nothing happened. But we then, and that was the other thing I did as, in my position as assistant to the president for state and local government, we began then to work with the state of Oregon because the governor thought it was a good idea. And the state senate in Oregon, the state rep in house in, in Oregon, and we got two additional free years of community college in the state of Oregon. They thought a student should put up $50, 5-0, $50 for each class, so they got a little skin in the game. And they wrote into the legislation, remedial education is covered. We did the same thing in Minnesota. I did the same thing with Tennessee. We did the same thing in Delaware. And you know, in Kentucky, uh, there was a bill that was passed, and the governor vetoed it for the first year. And we're waiting to see if the second year of the biennium He's going to have free community college, but we haven't heard much about that lately. So those are the kinds of things where I learned really bright people, but every now and then you ought to have somebody from that boomer group who's been there, done that. Thank you all so very much.
This has been a Metro TV production.